Okay, and welcome back to this online resource on writing for the academic job market, specifically focusing on diversity statements. We are now at part three of this resource. If you haven't looked at part one or part two yet, I do recommend you do those first. Part one thinks about why diversity statements are important, gives some of the broader context for why diversity statements are often required. Part two thinks about general guidelines for your statement and how you might select and organize different experiences. And we're now at part three, addressing some common questions and offering strategies for drafting, revising, and getting feedback on your statement before you submit it. Okay, so let's get started with part three. So in this video, we'll talk through a few common questions and some very general answers. A quick disclaimer that the questions that I will review, I'll review in this video are general questions that we often receive during live versions of this workshop. Um, those questions might not apply to you or your situation, or they might not make sense to you, and that's okay. If you have a question that isn't answered in this video, please reach out to us, or you can book a writing consultation if you are a graduate student. And this video will end with some general suggestions for drafting by revising and getting feedback on your statement. But before we get into the common questions, I just want to give you again a quick reminder of your purpose when you are writing a diversity statement. These are the things that you are trying to communicate, so your communication purpose, the thing that you're trying to get across in the statement. In your statement, you are trying to show your reader an authentic view into how you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and or educational justice based on a curated retelling of some of your experiences and what you've learned from those experiences. That reflects an awareness of your future role at, in shaping and contributing to educational access, opportunity, and attainment at your reader's institution. So again, we went through each of these in greater detail in part two, so if you're confused about any of these purposes, please refer back to the part two video or send us an email and reach out to us or book a consultation I'll explain more about how to do that at the end of this video. And again, from our another quick reminder or expanded re reminders about your purpose that some scholars will be able to connect their personal background to efforts to diversify the professoriate. So that means that they might come from an experience, a background, a community that is relatively unrepresented or underrepresented in institutions of higher education. And in that case, they should certainly talk about that. And if that applies to you, you should talk about that if that is an important and authentic part of your experience, and especially an important part of how you will pursue being an educator, being a faculty at an institution of higher education. That is an important way to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But if you don't feel that applies to you, remember that there are other valid approaches to this statement that don't necessarily have to do with your personal identity or your personal background. And again, I want to re recommend and emphasize that you should be authentic and show that you've thought carefully about your experiences and that you take your role and your role as a person in this institution very seriously. Again, in part one, we explored how institutions of higher education have incredible social impact and so if we work in those institutions, if we work in those places, we have a responsibility to take that social impact seriously. And so that's what you're trying to come across. And that's what you're trying to communicate in this statement, that you've thought about that, that you take it seriously, and you have real ideas for how you want to be an inclusive professional in this environment. And again, remember that diversity and equity and inclusion in higher ed is everyone's job. Ultimately, the goal is that you should learn something by writing your diversity statement. Learn something about yourself, learn something about the institution you've been working in, about the institution you are applying to work in, or about higher education more broadly. So as a reminder that there's lots of different kinds of content that you might put into this statement, but the goal is the same that you want to show that you've thought really carefully about what your responsibilities are and what you might do to create a more inclusive and equitable educational environment for people. And that is true regardless of your discipline, your field of study, or your research area. So here are some common questions. Again, these are 
questions that we often receive in live in-person versions of this workshop. So I'm going to review some of these questions that we often get and some very generic answers. Again, the disclaimer that this question or these answers might not apply to you and they might not apply to all situations. So you can reach out to us um, if you have further questions. You can book a writing consultation to get readers feedback. But the most important thing that you can do if you have specific questions about yourself or your statement or a draft you have in progress is just to get readers feedback. You should ask readers for their um, thoughts, their impression. You should ask your reader the question that you have lingering in your mind to see if that's coming across for your reader as well. So, so I'll go through some of these questions and I'll offer some very general answers. Um, so some folks ask, how much do these statements really matter? Is this just one requirement among many requirements for an academic job application? And I would generally say they matter. <laughs> Don't treat this as just a box to check. And at the end of the day, you should write for readers who really care about equity, inclusion, and diversity on their campus or in their department. So don't write for the person who you worry might think this is just a waste of time. You don't want to write for that, for that person, and that person probably either doesn't exist or is on their way out of the university. You should write for people who you believe really care about creating more equitable environments for students and for professionals in higher education. You might be wondering if the audience is expecting an autobiographical account of barriers, right? Do I need to talk about the different ways that I've overcome challenges in my life? Is that what a diversity statement is for? Well, yes and no. The audience that is going to be reading your statement does expect to learn about you. So in some ways, your diversity statement must be autobiographical. We did talk about this in part two and also in part one, that your statement draws upon your experiences and what you've learned from those experiences to shape um, and to communicate how yourself as a future faculty will be shaped and grown from that experience. But you don't necessarily need to include discussions of barriers or challenges that you've overcome. However, you should include a discussion of those challenges if they do genuinely apply to your educational journey and if they shape how you will approach your role as a faculty member or higher education professional. So if those challenges are actually quite meaningful to you and they will shape who you will be, your future self, your best future self in this role, in this professional environment, you should absolutely address those and focus on how they've shaped you and how they will continue to shape you in the future. Um, some folks often ask that they um, what they should prioritize and what they should choose because they feel like they have a lot to write about. So these might be folks who feel like they have a lot of backgrounds and identities and communities that they might want to be speaking from and from their experiences, or that they are really involved and they have lots of potential experiences to choose from. If that's so, um, great. That's awesome. That's great. Um, you should prioritize, though, the experiences that have been most impactful for you. So if you have a lot of experiences that you think you could draw upon, it would be very hard to write about all of them. And remember, in part two, we talked about that it's important to resist the urge to list because listing doesn't necessarily show deep engagement or deeper thinking, and it also encourages your reader to skim. And so if you have a lot that you could potentially talk about and you're not sure what to prioritize, I'd recommend focusing on those experiences that have been most most impactful for you in their significance or the lesson, the thing that has really taught you something about yourself, about the institution, about education, about society, or about how you want to engage with your future professional role. If you're still not sure if that feels like, I don't know, there's still too many things um, that shape me really, really profoundly, that's okay too. Um, in that case, you might want to shift to a uh, considering experiences that will be especially relevant for your reader's institutional context. So here you might switch into the mode of organizational empathy, and you might think which of these experiences or which of these lessons and future implications are going to be especially resonant for someone in this kind of institutional context. So if you're not sure still what's going to be most authentic and important for you to talk about for yourself, consider shifting gears and thinking about the institutional context of your reader and that might help you make decisions about what to prioritize. You might feel like you have a lot of privilege or that you're not unrepresented or underrepresented in higher education. So that might leave you feeling like you don't have much to write about. This is especially true if you think that the diversity statement 
must or should be an account, an autobiographical account of barriers or challenges. Um, so I'd encourage you to think a little bit more broadly about the things that you could discuss as a person who feels like they have a lot of privilege or advantage. So consider what you have done in the past or what you will do in the future to make the university a better or more inclusive and equitable place. So as a person with privilege, consider where you have the ability and the responsibility to create change, to start initiatives, to build things, to build things in partnerships with communities and community centers on the campus. Um, so I would say think about where you can use that advantage to the benefit of others to make the university a more inclusive place. Okay, a few more questions. Is there anything in particular I should avoid? Yes, there are definitely things you want to avoid. In general, I would say avoid speaking on behalf of communities, especially communities that you're not part of. Um, this is just sort of murky territory. Just don't try to appropriate others' experiences or speak for other people. Um, if you, uh, another way that you want to avoid appropriating others' experiences is if you witnessed a, a situation that you think is relevant to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it happened to someone else, but you observed this and it, it showed you something or it taught you something, you want to be careful in how you talk about that experience because you might be appropriating somebody else's negative experience or maybe even their positive experience for the benefit of yourself. Um, so again, really focus focus on yourself. If talking about something you've observed was really important and really impactful for you, you need to keep the focus on yourself um, and how it impacted you to see and witness or observe this thing and why that was so impactful and how that changed you and how that will change you in the future. But you don't generally want to appropriate anyone's experience. You also should avoid drawing, drawing false equivalencies between your experiences and that of marginalized groups or communities. So just because you might have a certain identity or you might have experienced a certain thing um, in your higher education journey because of your background or because of your identity doesn't mean you understand the experiences of other groups. So you should avoid making false comparisons between yourself and other groups or between um, groups you've interacted with, communities that you may have interacted with during your time. This is just generally, um, I would say, avoid this as much as you can. Lots of folks wonder how to show thoughtfulness without sounding overly confident um, or vague or cliche. And again, I would recommend centering your statement on your experiences and the lessons you've learned and to be explicit and sin sincere in the way that you talk about how these experiences have shaped you. Again, remember that what you choose to focus on and how you choose to talk about it and the lessons that you say you've learned and will apply in your future as a result of that experience, all of those things show how you think. So focus your, on your experiences and the lessons you've learned. Include essential details to make the experience concrete and tangible and be direct and sin sincere in saying what you've learned from those experiences. You might be wondering if you should use certain buzzwords. There's lots of buzzwords circling around in the field of higher education, um, not only related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also related to other aspects of our work. Um, and sometimes I think it's really easy to want to include those buzzwords and to sprinkle them in just to show that you know them, to show that you're up to date and you have been following along and that you're paying attention. Um, but this can be tricky, right? Because if you sprinkle too many buzzwords into your statement, it might come off as vague or it might come off as cliche or overly confident or lacking in real authentic substance. So I would say use the words and terms that are actually relevant to what you're trying to express. Don't use a, a terminology related to diversity or inclusion or justice just so that you can, just so that it appears and makes an appearance in your statement. Because if it's not actually useful for you to communicate what you want to communicate, then it doesn't belong in there. And you don't have a lot of space in a diversity statement. So don't waste that space with empty terminology and empty buzzwords that won't really carry a lot of meaning. So remember also that you don't need to perform, you need to show how you think and what's important to you. And the best way to do that in a statement this short is to be simple and to be direct and concise in your language and to not necessarily overload the language with terminology that isn't really helpful for you. So only choose the terminology that is actually helpful because it actually specifically 
demonstrates and communicates what you want to say. And then finally, the one of the biggest questions, most common questions that we at, get asked is how the diversity statement connects to the teaching and or research statement. These are the other two important statements that are asked for in a job application for our faculty search portfolio. Um, so I would say that depending on what you're talking about, that they could either draw on the same experiences or different experiences. So if your teaching statement and your diversity statement focus on entirely different experiences, that's fine. I would say the diversity statement and the teaching statement are quite similar in how they're organized in that they both are grounded in themes. They use experiences to demonstrate and provide evidence for the thing that you say you care about, and they show what you've learned from those experiences and how that lesson will shape you as you go forward into the future. So as a genre, the teaching statement and the diversity statement are organized very similarly. And because they both draw upon your experiences as evidence, it might be easy to think that your experiences should cross over or that you can only select some experiences for teaching and other experiences for the diversity statement. And it really is up to you. So you might highlight different experiences entirely in the teaching statement versus the diversity statement. It really just depends on the lessons and the implications that you want to highlight. The most important thing is to think about how you will be shaped differently or how you will be shaped by your experiences differently for the two statements. So you want to be shaped toward making a more inclusive university, a more inclusive campus environment and demonstrate that in the teaching statement or I'm sorry, in the diversity statement. But in the teaching statement, creating an inclusive environment might be part of your teaching intentions. That might be part of your future. So it really just depends on what you want to emphasize in the relative statements. That might be different experiences that lead to different lessons and get applied in different ways in the two different statements. Alternatively, if both statements draw upon the same experience or the same set of experiences, you should be sure to highlight different lessons or different implications, recommend, re recognizing that the teaching statement and the diversity statement do have two different functions. They communicate two slightly different things. And so it's okay if you're starting from the same kernel of the experience. So if you're talking about a teaching experience you've had or mentoring experience that you've had, some other kind of educational experience that you've had that could be relevant to both the teaching statement and the diversity statement, that's okay. But highlight different lessons or different significances from those experiences that are the, from that experience that is relative to the genre that you're working in. So it just depends how you do this. Um, it's really up to you. It's up to the institution you're applying for and how you want to think about that. But this is my general advice. And if you have further questions about that, you can certainly get a consultation or reach out to us over email and we can help clarify it for your particular situation even further. Okay. So we're nearing the end of this resource and I wanna offer some concluding thoughts on drafting and revising and getting feedback. But first I want to take, give you a quick note on samples. Most of us have never written a diversity statement before. And if we have, maybe we've written one or two and it might've been when we are applying to graduate school. Um, we don't have a lot of practice in this genre. So it's really easy to go online and to Google or to search for examples of diversity statements or examples of other personal statements just to help us get a sense of what we're doing. And again, that's because we don't have a lot of familiarity reading or writing in this genre. And so that's perfectly understandable but you should be mindful of models. Be mindful of any diversity statement that you find online. There's a reason for that. And that's because statements are all over the map. Remember that the content will be widely varied because all of us are very different and we all have very different experiences and backgrounds and journeys through education. And so a model is not necessarily going to show you what to include or what you should include because that's up to you and the life you've had. So again, remember this won't speak to your experiences, your values, or your future goals. I would also recommend not looking at, at these samples as, or these models as things to emulate because emulating models from others can often lead to bland, cliche, or vague statements. And again, that's because the information that is included in the example 
might not be relevant to your experience. So you want to, again, focus on yourself and what you want to convey and be mindful of the models that you, you find. It is okay to look for models. It is okay to look for examples, especially because we don't have a lot of familiarity with this genre. But I would say to use the models more generically, meaning look to the models for features of the genre and less for features of content. So you can look to models for, to see how things are organized, to see how writers make transitions between ideas or between different paragraphs. You might look to different models to see if there's an average length or a sort of acceptable minimum and maximum length. And you might look to see just the kind of language that they use. Do I see a lot of terminology in here? Is this more direct, simple language? Um, so you can look for the features of the genre in the examples that you find. But don't look to them for don't look to them for content ideas and substantive content, right? And that's for all of the things that I've just said. And I would recommend instead of spending your time searching online for models of diversity statements, just spend that time thinking about yourself. Spend that time considering your values, your interests, brainstorming ideas, researching broadly um, topics on educational equity or researching the institution or institutions that you're applying for and seeing what kind of initiatives or projects they have going on. See what you can learn from their institutional research department about the statistics for their enrollment and maybe their attrition, which is the people who drop out versus completion, right? So you can spend the same amount of time that you would normally spend looking for examples and reading examples online and just channel that time into more sort of productive brainstorming and research activities that will be more relevant to you as a writer for your statement. Okay, and when it's time to start writing, you've looked at some some models and now you're ready to start writing. Again, I wanna say spend more time in the brainstorming stage, not less. Remember that your first purpose in the statement is to demonstrate an authentic view into how you think. So in order to do that, you should spend some time thinking about how you think. Um, and also recognize that the more time you spend in the brainstorming stage, the clearer your ideas become. You might also find connections between experiences that you might not have seen before if you were trying to rush through it. And also having this kind of detailed account or brainstorming activities might help you in other phases of the hiring process. Remember that higher education hiring is often multifaceted. There's usually campus visits and interviews. So spending some time in the brainstorming stage, thinking about your experiences, your values, what you wanna prioritize as you go forward in your future role will all be helpful to you in those other aspects of the hiring process as well as the diversity statement. Remember that all applications for all jobs will require some investment, some investment of time um, and energy, but do scale your investment to your interest in the position. So um, I wouldn't recommend just sort of approaching this with a checkbox mentality or just send out the same statement to all the different jobs you apply for. Because again, you do want to tailor your statement at least to some degree to the institutional context that you're applying for. You want to at least be mindful and empathetic toward the institutional context of your reader. However, um, I recognize you might be applying for lots of different jobs and you might not have the time to do that really delicately and really carefully for all of the job applications you're preparing. And that's okay, but do scale your investment of time and energy to your interest in the position. So if this is a position you really care about and it's an institution you really want to be a part of, do let your investment match your interest. So spend more time thinking about the institutional context of your audience and trying to get a sense of if the lessons that you've learned from your experience will resonate with that audience or if the future implications for your experience, how you want to be shaped in the future, will be resonant and relevant to an audience in that context. Do scale that with your interest in the position, recognizing that all applications will require some intentional investment of your time. When you start writing, I recommend just free writing at first. Don't worry too much about getting the ideas right or making it sound um, sparkly or making it sound smart or even making it sound simple and direct. Just get ideas out there. Just free write as much as you can. Get lots of ideas on the table. 
don't judge yourself. You can cut it out later. No one has to see it but you. But when you're first starting writing, just start writing and let it all come out. Just write freely. When you start working on this as a more sort of polished draft, or even when you're thinking about how do you take what you've free written and turn it into something that looks like an actual statement draft, you should start talking about your ideas in addition to writing them. Remember that having a conversation with someone where you are forced to articulate the thoughts in your head in real time can be hugely beneficial because that conversation can create clarity, especially if you can have a conversation with someone who can ask you follow up questions like what do you mean by that or can you tell me more or what experience leads you to that idea. All of those kinds of questions and having to answer those kinds of questions can be really beneficial for your thinking. So remember to talk about your ideas in addition to writing them. When you're writing and when you're, especially when you're at the point where you're working on a draft, a draft in progress, imagine a human reader. Don't imagine a kind of academic machine. You're not writing for a machine, you're writing for a person and you're writing for maybe two or three people. So do imagine a human being and try to imagine them in their context. If it helps, imagine them sitting in an office. Imagine what their office looks like and sounds like and smells like and what kinds of books they might have on the walls. Just imagine the actual person reading this document and that will help you keep the writing more sincere and more simple and less, let's say, jargony. And when keeping that in mind, remember you're not trying to promote yourself or perform. You don't need to worry about selling yourself to this audience. You need to worry about connecting with them person to person. So focus on being authentic, focus on what's important to you and trying to communicate what's important to you clearly so that a reader can understand and get to know you. And do prioritize your writing time. The diversity statement is not gonna write itself. So you can come to the writing room, which is a service of the writing hub. That's a daily time and space for you to write Monday through Friday mornings, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And there's information about that on our website. But whether it's at the writing room or some other place, set aside time in your calendar and work on the statement. Do prioritize your writing time and try to say no to things that get in the way of you and your writing. So once you're working on, you have a draft in progress and it's time to revise the statement, here's some recommendations. The first is to stop thinking in terms of fixing this draft. I myself have this problem a lot where I have a draft in progress and it probably would be faster and easier for me to just throw it away or put it away and start fresh because I have lots of good ideas in my head and those good ideas are prevent, I can't work those good ideas into the draft I've already got. So I sit and try to force them. I tr try to force the ideas into the draft and it just doesn't work. So I call this the sunk cost fallacy of writing where you've already put time into it. You've already have words on paper. So I have to just work with the draft I've got. No, you don't. Um, and especially with a statement that's this short, it's only two pages. So you don't necessarily need to think in terms of fixing this draft. You can start again and you can write lots of drafts. They can all be really different. Remember that each time you write a draft, you are learning from that process. You are learning from the writing process. Your ideas are getting clearer and crisper in your mind. It's making more sense to you how to find connections between your ideas. So you learn with each new draft. It's not a waste of time. And so if you're finding yourself having a hard time with a draft in progress and you're just not quite sure how to fix it, consider starting again and recognize that starting again won't be a waste of your time. You will probably be faster when you write the second draft. Your ideas will probably be more clear and more interesting because you're, you've had more time to process and think about them. And worst case scenario, you have two potential good drafts to revise and work from and even more information carrying around that you can carry with you into further aspects of the hiring process. Do focus on trying to make your experiences work together that tell a story for the reader. So if you're not sure where to begin revising your statement, focus on if the stories that you've selected, those experiences, the significance, and the implications work together. Do they build toward a complete picture of who you are? So if you're not sure what should be revised, think about that first. Think about how the stories you've selected in the body paragraphs of the statement 
come together and the picture that they paint together. And if you're pleased with that picture, and if not, that might give you a place to start. You should get feedback from lots of different people, especially people outside of your department. In departments, we often speak very similar academic languages and we tend to take certain things for granted. Getting feedback from folks outside of your department and outside of your discipline can be really beneficial because they don't see things the same way you see it. And that can help you see things in your statement that you might not see and that someone in your department might also not see. So do get feedback from lots of different people. And when you ask for feedback, also share your concerns or worries. So you can ask your readers the specific thing that you're worried about is happening in the statement and ask them if they agree or ask them their impressions of that specific detail about the statement when you read. Ask for, invite the feedback that is going to be most helpful so that you can signal to your reader what they should prioritize in giving um, in their feedback to you. But ideally what you're wanting to do with when you ask for feedback is just to get a sense of your reader's experience. See how the reader is experiencing your writing, how your words are landing for them, and be informed by their reader's experience. And along this line, you can have a, a graduate students can have a consultation appointment with a grad writing consultant in the Writing Hub. These can be 60 minutes or 30 minute conversations. And again, these are conversations with folks who are probably outside of your discipline. We have grad writing consultants from a variety of different disciplines across campus. And remember that a productive conversation where someone is asking you targeted questions and following your logic and helping you see your thinking and what you're saying, um, how that appears in the draft or how it doesn't appear in the draft, that can be hugely beneficial, especially if you find yourself really stuck or you're not sure what to do next. Um, a conversation can be more productive than just sitting at your computer trying to muscle your way through revising this statement. So do consider making a consultation appointment. And so if you want feedback, you can make an appointment with a grad writing consultant for one-on-one um, -on -one feedback, or if you just want to find somebody to a supportive person to talk through, um, if you're not sure, feeling kind of uncertain with a diversity statement, and you just want to talk to a friendly person who can maybe give you some ideas for how to move forward, then that's also fine too. You don't have to have a draft in process in progress. You can come to the writing hub and work with a consultant. Even when you're in the brainstorming and planning stage, they can help you um, think through your ideas and think about what's important to convey. So if you're a graduate student and you would like to book a writing consultation with one of our grad writing consultants, you would just go to our website, writinghub.ucsd.edu hover over the grad students tab, and then click on make an appointment. That's gonna take you to an external service that we use an external scheduling portal called MyWC Online. If you've never used MyWC Online before, you'll need to register for an account, um, but don't worry, it doesn't send you a ton of spam emails. It just sends you emails um, about appointments that you book. So once you register for an account, you can log in. You will need to use your ucsd.edu email address, and you can select the grad appointment schedule and see consultant's availability, and you can self-select and self-book your own appointment with the consultant of your choice who's available at a convenient time for you. So here are some references that we um, referenced in this presentation. This is also in the resource sheet. And with that, I wanna say, if you still have questions about the diversity statement, please reach out to us. We are here to support you. And of course you can book an appointment with a writing consultant if you are a graduate student, but if you have other questions or you're not a graduate student, please reach out to us. If you want questions about writing the diversity statement, how to um, think through ideas or how to communicate those ideas, please reach out to uh, the Writing Hub at writinghub at ucsd.edu. If you want to talk through about how your diversity statement and your teaching statement um, both overlap and also how they can be distinct, or if you generally want to think about how diversity and teaching are connected um, or inclusion and teaching are connected, you can reach out to the Engage Teaching Hub, and that's at engageteaching at ucsd.edu. With that, I want to thank you for your time and attention in using this resource. I hope you found it helpful, and do please connect with us. We look forward to working with you on your diversity statement.